the line where he's where her father says to her, I'm Britney Spears now is, you know, completely striking. If you become the conservator or the guardian, you are essentially holding the legal rights of the conservatee in making decisions about her medical care, about her money, about where she lives, about what she eats. It's an extreme way to say it, but he's not that far off from from what it means. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. On October 24th, Britney Spears released her tell-all memoir, The Woman in Me. In the book, she traces her journey from child stardom to living 13 years under the control of a conservatorship, a court-sanctioned arrangement that strips people with disabilities of their civil liberties. Now, in Brittany's case, her dad, who she characterizes in the book as an addict and an absent and sometimes abusive father, was able to gain legal rights over her life and her business, beginning when Brittany was just 26 years old, forcing her to work, surveilling and controlling her daily life habits, and making all of her healthcare choices for her. Britney's conservatorship initially made global headlines in 2021, catapulting conservatorship as a legal construct into public dialogue and calling into question its use in the lives of more than one million other Americans with disabilities. Britney's success in terminating her conservatorship also propelled the state of California to sign meaningful legislation into law, requiring courts to consider alternatives to conservatorship and making it easier for others to terminate their own. So today we're checking in with Zoe brennan Crone, who I originally spoke to back in 2021, when this case first made headlines. Zoe's a staff attorney with the ACLU's Disability Rights Project, and she's worked on conservatorship cases for many years, including filing amicus briefs in support of Britney Spears. We've both read the memoir, and now we're ready to discuss. So with that, Zoe, welcome back to At Liberty, and thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Kendall. It's great to be here. Okay. So we both read the book. I want to start our conversation with a broader theme I think that was really prevalent in the book, which is that Brittany and other women family members before her, like her grandmother, Jean Spears, were consistently pathologized for mental health struggles, in particular those relating to losing pregnancies, children, or experiencing postpartum depression. And Brittany opens the book actually talking about her grandmother who lost her baby and then had been sent to an asylum and eventually died by suicide. She also notes the abuse committed by her grandfather and then her dad. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I think it's really important that she kind of begins the book with exploring her family history because um, I think it adds a lot of context to her own experience. But I, I was wondering from you, like, how does this desire to pathologize mental health challenges, particularly when they're experienced by women or people of color, mimic what we see in society at large? And I wonder what your reaction was to knowing this information, given what we all know now about Brittany's experience and her conservatorship. I also thought it was a telling and moving and terribly sad beginning of the book that yeah. she has, that there are these generations of women, of poor women who have been, like you said, who have been pathologized and institutionalized because of tragedy and to heartbreak. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so much of what we think of as normal in a society, what we consider pathological and not pathological is a reflection of norms in society. And very often and historically, those are norms set by men. It's quite remarkable to see the echoes of, of her, of her family and of, you know, our history as a country in, in, in the book. Yeah, I mean, I think specifically when we think about the history of who was institutionalized, who was deemed crazy, I mean, literally the entire concept of quote-unquote hysteria 
you know, was something that people called women in order to pathologize their reactions, most notably, I think, around um, reproductive experiences that they were having. We see this theme come into picture as Brittany rises to success, right? So she starts facing this kind of bind of having these normal reactions and responses But because there's more attention on her, because she's footing the bill for her entire family, it seems to be of higher stakes. And there's an easier kind of slippery slope into pathologizing them. So we have the sadness she feels when Justin Timberlake urges her to get an abortion, the depressions she sinks into when Justin breaks up with her, and the the social anxiety that follows and increases with the aggressive paparazzi documentation of her life the postpartum depression she experiences after the birth of her son, Jaden, the child custody battles with her ex, Kevin Federline, the death of her aunt. All of this, it seems, I mean, just reading it as a person witnessing her life experiences, I was pummeled by just this constant drumbeat of of trauma, it, it seemed, in her life. And in the book, we are experiencing this tension of Brittany herself wondering if she herself was overblowing the conditions of her life, which I think feels like the cost of sexism and ableism. When I was reading it, I was like, oh, this is the kind of gaslighting that seeps into our minds when we have a culture that um, doesn't tolerate discomfort that people have with regular experiences that women go through, that people with disabilities go through. Yeah, I think the ways that we create pathologies to stop behavior that we as a society, as the mainstream people in control in a society don't want, is a very dark history. And hysteria Mm -hmm. is exactly an example of that. There's a lot of power in pathologizing things, in treating things as mental illness, as something to be... and, And there's a lot that you can do once you have framed something that way. And I think we see that as well in in Brittany's family history. Right. One of the things that really struck me in in reading that section was how alone she was with all of it. She didn't Mm. really have adults in her life who could help her go through those experiences. Right. And she did have a lot of adults in her life who were not helping her, honestly, who had their own interests, who were trying to manipulate her or direct her or set the stage for her to act in a certain way. And then down the line, that the response to the fact that she hadn't really had that is to take away her rights to learn about this. And then we hold that against her. And then Mm -hmm. it's a cause to take away her rights under the conservatorship. Um, It it just feels so, so unfair. This gets created by failures in our society in lack of understanding of, of disability, of her depression, sexism, all of this. And then, and then it gets thrown, thrown at her. So I think you're right. And I think, yes, she has the kind of exceptionalism being that she is going through this as a child star. And there's this emphasis by her team and her family for very obvious financial reasons to to force her to work or to put her back on tour. And in the book, she's just tracing these horrible experiences and then explaining how she doesn't, she needs time. She just is tired. She doesn't want to get out of bed. And it seems like her lack of desire to go back on tour, to work harder, is what it what tips the scales for her family uh, to seek control over her life through her conservatorship when they feel that their own financial stability, perhaps, is being threatened by Britney's autonomous decision that she'd like to take a break from performing. I'm wondering how this follows the kind of trend line or storyline that other people fall into conservatorships, that proving you can or will work as some kind of litmus test for whether or not you are worthy of your own autonomy. Yeah, I think I, I agree with with a lot of what you're saying. And one thing that struck me about her experiences going through this is how she said a few times in the book that she just wanted to make people happy. She really 
identifies herself at that age really being a people pleaser and that this Mm -hmm. was a turning point of of pushing back against that and that that you know triggered this this whole process and this framing of her as someone who could not be autonomous because she wanted something that was at odds with what the people around her want I do think that the ability to work or to manage day-to-day things is a very common litmus test in conservatorships. A lot of parents of of young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are told that they should, as a matter of course, get a guardianship when their child turns 18. And some of the assessments of whether the child needs a guardian are, or the adult, the young adult needs a guardian, are looking at sort of everyday things and seeing whether this brand new adult is able to do them on their own. And Mm -hmm. it's such a double standard. I mean, I I think of myself as it really is. Yeah. If I think of myself as an 18 year old, if I was brought before a judge who wanted me to explain how to balance a checkbook, I didn't know how to balance a checkbook. And I, People don't balance checkbooks anymore. Yeah, they don't. Or like, do you know who to call if there's a plumbing problem in your apartment? And only people who get into the conservatorship or guardianship space because they're perceived as being disabled get subjected to that test. When in fact, almost no one could pass, quote unquote, that test when they were 18. And that's because that's what it is to be a young adult, to be figuring out what works, to be learning from your mistakes. And people who are under conservatorship or guardianship or at risk of it are not afforded that um, luxury. And there's Mm -hmm. a, a quote I really liked from Brittany's book. She said, in the conservatorship, I felt Like I was being deprived of those good secrets of life, those fundamental Mm. supposed sins of indulgence and adventure that make us human. They wanted to take Mm. away that specialness and keep everything as rote as possible. It was death to my creativity as an artist. And I just thought that was so striking. Yeah, absolutely. There's also this theme, again, this is all leading into Brittany's Um, eventual conservatorship of fit or unfit parenting, especially as Brittany is navigating child custody battles with Kevin Vetterlein, which, by the way, is kind of a legal uh, tactic used to win a custody battle. But it's all very public, and Kevin and his team are trying to slander her ability to parent which I think is so in step with how mothers, mothers of color, and particularly mothers with disabilities are eventually like separated from their children and told that they're unfit parents, which I wanted to just get into a little bit and really use this as an opportunity to talk about the landscape of family regulation and and what separation looks like for, for mothers with disabilities in particular. What can you tell us about that? Unfortunately, it's very common for parents with disabilities to have their um, fitness to parent called into question, um, whether through referrals to um, child protective services or having kids taken away or very intrusive inquiries into their home and how they are. And a lot of that is based purely on stereotype and on stigma and on people not realizing how people with disabilities can and do parent and parent well. And it also stems from the lack of supports that parents with disabilities, like parents without disabilities, experience. And, you know, what the family regulation child welfare system should be doing is supporting parents with disabilities, providing reasonable modifications is the legal term for it, providing support to allow them to parent rather than saying, oh, you can't do this, so therefore you're not able to parent anymore. And the absence of that in Brittany's case is striking and also striking because there was so much money around. I mean, the much more common way you see this play out, there's also poverty and families can't 
pay for the support they might need. And, um, and here seeing that sort of weaponizing of both this mother's desperate love for her children and her severe depression is really sad. And, and as you said, has echoes in what we see in parents with disabilities, especially parents of color across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so all of that is an unfortunate reality within our system. And I think it's really important to like stop and address the fact that while Brittany's uh, situation is, yeah, specific, it's also not unique. And uh, Brittany's kids are eventually taken away from her, at least temporarily. And she, in response, uh, shaves her head, which I think everyone everyone listening to this will like remember that because it was very public. And in the book, she addresses the head shaving head on. And I wanted to read a little bit of that. She says on page 148 to 149, with my head shaved, everyone was scared of me, even my mom. No one would talk to me anymore because I was too ugly. My long hair was a big part of what people liked, and I, I knew that. I knew a lot of guys thought long hair was hot. Shaving my head was a way of saying to the world, fuck you. You want me to be pretty for you? Fuck you. You want me to be good for you? Fuck you. You want me to be your dream girl? Fuck you. I'd been the good girl for years. I'd smile politely while TV show hosts leered at my breasts, while American parents said I was destroying their children by wearing a crop top, while executives patted my hand condescendingly and second guessed my career choices, even though I'd sold millions of records, while my family acted like I was evil and I was tired of it. And at the end of the day, I didn't care. She goes on to say, a friend of mine once said, if someone took my baby away from me, I would have done a lot more than get a haircut. I would have burned the city to the ground. Uh, when I read this, I was like, okay, touche, Brittany. Um, sometimes it is just all a little bit too much. But it stood out to me that she said that everyone was afraid of her because she was too ugly. They wouldn't talk to her. And the dynamics of what kind of fear does in our response to people who are clearly having a hard time. What did this moment speak to you about how we respond to people who are in crisis? I think you're right about the how deep the fear runs. And I think there's a very strong desire that many people have to push away or otherize someone who is acting in a way that is different than what you, how you expect them to be based on your, based on society, based on what you know of that person. And I think in the case of Brittany, it was ridicule. It was that the mm -hmm. reaction of the public, the reaction of, in tabloids was, was absolute ridicule. Um, and I think the more common reaction for someone who isn't famous mm -hmm. is a different type of otherizing, but is, you know, there's a dehumanizing feeling as well. Yeah. When we think about our reaction to people who are experiencing mental health crises or symptoms of mental health disabilities or substance use disorder or, or using substances um, that we have a discomfort with it. And there's a strong reaction to push it away rather than look and think about what's happening and why it's happening and how this person is still a person and what kind of, you know, how you can connect. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the otherizing can, can often mean like a forced removal from society, being put in jails or prisons. All of her experience just was so heavy and hard and reading about it was, you know, it just it felt so understandable. Um, and I always think about how if we were able to read everyone's memoir of what has happened to them and um, how they're reacting to things that have happened to them in their life, we would probably have a lot more compassion for people in all different kinds of situations. 
I want to get into the conservatorship specifically. The book obviously traces so much of her life, but a rather large focal point is her conservatorship, the events that led there, the experience of it, and then the journey out. On page 166 to 167, she writes, I was highly functional. I'd just done the best album of my career. I was making a lot of people a lot of money, especially my father, who I found out took a bigger salary than he paid me. He paid himself more than $6 million while paying others close to him tens of millions more. The thing is, you can have a conservatorship that lasts for two months, and then the person gets on track, and you let them control their life again. But that wasn't what my father wanted. He wanted far more. My dad was able to set up two forms of conservatorship, what's called conservatorship of the person and conservatorship of the estate. The conservator of the person is designated to control details of the conservatee's life, like where they live, what they eat, whether they can drive a car, what they do day to day. Even though I begged the court to appoint literally anyone else, and I mean anyone off the street would have been better, they eventually appoint her father. Um, she goes on to mention that her dad had started the conservatorship when he was on the heels of bankruptcy, that he would tell her she was fat, threaten her to work out, and legally bar her from dessert. So I want to start here about the conservatorship details. So what about this setup is unique and what is not unique to the over one million people who are living with conservatorships or guardianships in the U.S.? So... It's hard to answer that question because there is extraordinarily little data about conservatorships mm. and guardianships in the United States. Um, there's yeah. an estimate that 1.3 million people, adults in the U.S., are under a conservatorship or a guardianship, but that is very much an estimate because it's not tracked federally. It's not tracked Great. uniformly <laughs> in states, and I think that's really striking. Because we count things that we care about as a society. Mm -hmm. We keep track yeah. of information that we think is important to know. And the fact that whose rights have been taken away is not societally deemed important enough to know is very telling. Just the scale of money she had and money she had the potential to keep making if she did certain things yeah. is unique. This is from people I've spoken to, from sort of my guess of things, that what she describes of her father seeking the conservatorship really expressly to control her money and to benefit himself financially, I think that is likely not the majority of cases. It definitely happens, but... My sense from my anecdotal data set is that it's much more common that people end up in guardianships or conservatorships because someone is really trying to do the right thing and thinks that, that, that a guardianship or a conservatorship is the way to support someone, to get them to make changes that they need to make, that it is in their best interest. Um, and it can be quite harmful even so. So I'm not making that distinction in that those are the good conservatorships and ones like Britney's are the bad ones um, because it's not that simple. There are real harms to be, harms and risks to conservatorship even where everyone is doing their best and is trying to support a person. And so there's real risks in all kinds of guardianships and conservatorships, but I think that real manipulation, um, strategic conservatorship, as as Brittany describes it, is less common. But I don't think she's the only one for whom that has happened. Yeah, it was honestly really surprising to me to even see that it would be allowed to go into an effect, uh, given the really gross uh, conflicts of interests uh, that exist with her dad being able to fund his own life from from this setup. In the book, Brittany recounts this kind of overwhelming control that this conservatorship allowed her father to have over her life. Um, 
And it was really all encompassing. She recounts her book, her dad saying in the book, I'm Britney Spears now. Um, she talks about wanting to eat dessert and her father says no. Um, and she says, I felt like it was not just telling him telling me, but my family and my state, like I was not allowed to legally eat dessert because he said no. Obviously, these are feelings that Brittany's recounting. Um, how accurate is this interpretation to both her own conservatorship and to other conservatorships more broadly? It's pretty accurate. Um, I mean, when it's stunning. stunning. The line where he's where her father says to her, I'm Britney Spears now is, you know, completely striking, but is kind of true in certain ways that if you become the conservator or the guardian, you are essentially holding the legal rights of the conservatee. So he he is mm -hmm. acting as her in making decisions about her medical care, about her money, about where she lives, about what she eats, um, uh, who she sees, who she doesn't see. So it's, I mean, it's an extreme way to say it, but he's not that far off from, from what it means. And I think that really underscores how big a deal a conservatorship is. That is a huge amount of power that every conservator has, and they don't all use it or they don't certainly don't all use it in the way that he did but um he it's, did yeah it, that is sort of the structure you're taking your rights and giving them to someone else and so legally your legal personhood is not actually yours anymore it's it's held by your conservator yeah absolutely i mean so much of it felt like a legally sanctioned abuse situation. But one of the elements of her conservatorship that felt really scary to me as someone reading it who, you know, also has a personal understanding of the insidious ways people with disabilities can lose autonomy is Brittany's loss of bodily autonomy, being put on different psychiatric medication without her consent, being sent again and again to seemingly punitive rehab programs for very little reason, having reproductive choices made for her. This is another manifestation of bodily autonomy uh, uh, being stripped from, from folks in our country. And it's very much legal. So I'm wondering if you could speak to this. Right. I mean, as her conservator, he had the power to make medical decisions um, for Brittany, and that's common in conservatorships. Not always. Sometimes certain rights get carved out um, or retained, but it is not uncommon for a conservator to have the power to make medical decisions. And making that decision against someone else's will, against someone's will, is a really big deal. Forced treatment does not lead to good outcomes because people do not want to be forced into treatment. Like the, the cost of autonomy, of being valued as a person with preferences, of your wishes being heard, that has very long-term consequences. And I think the reproductive choices piece is also hugely important. Making reproductive choices for people with disabilities is like a very... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of history there. Right. I mean, there's a history, a not very far back history of forced sterilization of people with disabilities on a large scale. There's many people alive today mm -hmm. who were forcibly sterilized by the state. And overwhelmingly, those were black and brown women um, who either had disabilities or were treated as though they had disabilities. And... In some states, it's still possible for a guardian or a conservator to permanently, forcibly sterilize a person. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a whole process you have to go through. You can't just do it in your regular course of the decisions you make as a guardian or a conservator. Mm -hmm. But one thing that struck me about Brittany's case is that, you know, the the impact of being forced to have an IUD, which was her case, over a long period of time may not be functionally a lot different than sterilization. 
people with disabilities who do want to parent, who do, who are and want to be sexually active and right. are not given that choice because of um, either guardians making decisions or the state thinking that they're not fit to parent. Um, but yes, it's very complicated and very, um, like a very dark history of just not wanting that to exist, not wanting people with disabilities to have families or be part of families. When we look at the facts, the purpose of conservatorship is supposed to be used as a last resort when all other options, all other alternatives like cannot work. Um, they should be rare. But what we do know is that with the numbers that we have, they're not rare. When we think about how long Britney's conservatorship was, 13 years, <laughs> that's a really long time. 13 years is very long, but it's not surprising. Conservatorships and guardianships are generally much easier to get into than to get out of. Mm. I think there's a lot of people who get conservatorships where there isn't actually a problem it's trying to solve. It's just what the school told us we should do because our child is turning 18, or it's what the doctor told us we should do. And I think a big part of that is a view by courts and by the public generally of conservatorships and guardianships as being really fundamentally a benign and helpful institution. I think the word guardian ship itself signals that you think of a guardian angel who wouldn't who wouldn't want that right that combined with this you know deep paternalism towards people with disabilities mm -hmm. um generally i think makes it really feel to a lot of judges who are making decisions about this and people involved in the process like this is great it's a win win and the description she has about always having to behave a certain way I think is very, um, like very on the nose that you are in this catch 22, that if she pushed back and said she didn't like something, she didn't want to do something, then she is making bad decisions, quote unquote, or is out of control. And so that's of course used against you. And if you're doing mm -hmm. fine, that's also used against you because that shows that the conservatorship is working great. I mean, that tension strikes you, I think, the whole time when you're reading it because she it does feel really like she is trapped. I mean, to think that Brittany was probably feeling this just tenfold. Who is going to see me? Who is going to look out for me when you have this apparatus um, over you that that has has been really abusive to you, I think. Um, I just that the level of distress that that even makes me internally feel, which is why I was so heartened when we read about the process by which she does get out of her conservatorship. But at that time, she had a court-appointed attorney. And that was also very surprising to me because, uh, you know, the idea that, like, perhaps her father was also controlling what kind of attorneys she would be able to have in order to fight back against him. Um, I think of someone like Brittany and how hard it was for her to get this kind of just baseline legal representation that she wanted. How does this work? How do people in conservatorships get representation? And what's the difficulty here? So it varies state by state about how attorneys are appointed. It's sometimes county by county. Um, you do not always have a right to a lawyer in conservatorship or guardianship proceedings. There's a lot of problems with getting really good representation. Um, one is that there's a distinction between a person's best interest and their stated interest. And your stated interest is what you say you want. And your best interest is what someone else thinks you should want. And this is at the heart of all of this here, that if you have a conservator, they are supposed to make decisions in your best interest. And I think all of us would be living almost unrecognizably different lives if we were only making decisions in our own best interests. So often one of the ways that comes up is that sometimes lawyers who are representing people at 
in guardianship or conservatorship proceedings end up really talking about best interest rather than stated interest. And they should not be doing that. Mm. And I think it comes back to the same issue of viewing it, this as something kind of harmless and benign. Um, And so even if you have a lawyer, your lawyer might not be zealously advocating for what you say you want, even though they should be. So when Brittany was actually able to get her own desired representation, she writes that her new lawyer was appalled that I'd been denied my own lawyer for so long. He said, even vicious criminals get to pick their own lawyers. She continues later, on July 26th, he, being her new lawyer, Matthew, filed to eliminate my father from that role. After a big court hearing on September 29th, my father was suspended as my conservator. This is like all very rapid succession. Um, It was all over the news before Matthew could even call me after court. I felt relief sweep over me. The man who had scared me as a child and ruled over me as an adult, who had done more than anyone to undermine my self-confidence, was no longer in control of my life. At that point, with my father eliminated, Matthew told me we had momentum, and he petitioned for the end of the conservatorship altogether. So this is after the Free Britney movement had be- had begun, and we all had taken note. There have been documentaries about Britney Spears come out. Um, we've seen how public pressure has been able to create, you know, meaningful movement in legal victories, as diverse as death row cases, do clemency cases. Hey, even gay marriage being legalized. How much of a role do you think that the public dialogue played here? I think it changed the balance of the case when Brittany started talking. And so right. the tipping point of her saying, I don't want this, was huge. I thought that was really striking from one of her, the times she spoke in court, is that she was quite apologetic. She said, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I didn't know that I could ask for this to end. And I thought that was just really striking and and terrible. That is not how the system should be. So I think it did really change mm-hmm. things. Yeah, I mean, and the the hard part about that is that public pressure does not is not going to be part of most people's uh, bid to end their conservatorship. So that then, you know, makes it much more challenging. And we then need to use what happened to in Britney's case and the the public pressure that it mounted and apply it to widespread, broad sweeping legislation, um, which, you know, did happen at least in the state of California. On the heels of Britney's freedom, the state of California passed legislation reforming their conservatorship system, um, which is that bill was called the Probate Conservatorship Reform and Supported Decision Making Act. Can you tell us about the legislation that was passed kind of on the heels of of Britney's freedom? Yeah, so the legislation that was passed really tried to make changes to slow down the process of people getting into conservatorships, Mm -hmm. to give people more information and rights within conservatorships, and to make it easier to get out of conservatorships. And then the other thing the law did was recognize supported decision-making as Mm -hmm. a valid, legally recognized way that people with disabilities can get support to make and understand uh, and communicate their own choices. Mm -hmm. So the issue where, at the end, where she said, I didn't know that I could ask to get out or how, Mm -hmm. is... I think very common. And usually if you want to petition to terminate a conservatorship, you have to go to the website of the county court of the county that you're in and download a form and get it signed and fill out all this stuff and send it to the right place in order to start that process. And one of the things that the bill changed is that it got rid of those barriers. And so the bill says that any communication to the court by a person under conservatorship saying that they don't want to be in that conservatorship is treated as a properly filed 
petition to terminate the conservatorship. And then the process flows from there. And another change in the bill is that people under conservatorship are given information about what the terms are of their conservatorship. So kind of shockingly, until this law was passed last year, in a conservatorship, the conservator gets all of this information. They know what their responsibilities are. And the conservatee, the person who's lost all their rights, didn't get anything. And so (laughs) the bill says, you've got to tell this person what rights did they lose? What rights didn't they lose? And who you can contact if you are not happy with how things are going. Like, here's the phone number. Um, And it should be written in plain, accessible language, not in legalese. So you know where you stand with these choices. It sounds like a great step forward. I know that you and your team were involved in both pushing for that legislation and in providing some level of guidance to to Brittany's team. What was that like getting involved at least like tangentially in this case? So we filed actually two briefs and one was an amicus brief on behalf of um, dozens of uh, civil and disability rights organizations around the country, highlighting the importance of um, of choice and autonomy within a conservatorship, and in that, and specifically regarding her right to choose her own lawyer, because that was the key question in that hearing. One of the strange situations for Brittany was that she hadn't chosen her previous lawyer, but she was paying him. And then the other thing we filed in for that same hearing was around supported decision making and that someone like Brittany, who has been in a conservatorship for a long time, it it's a big jump from not being yeah. able to make any choices to being able to make all choices. Uh-huh. And sort of informing the court of that and, and suggesting that supported decision making might be something she would want to do in choosing her own lawyer and in generally down the line. But I think our our main goal in working on that was really to advise the court and the parties of the big picture implications. So you you spoke just now about uh, the transition into uh, from from kind of being granted freedom from your conservatorship into being able to make all of your own decisions. I want to read this excerpt from the book about the moment that she found out about her freedom. Brittany writes, Still, I couldn't believe it when he called me as soon as he came out of the court hearing and told me it was done. I was free. Even though it was his strategy that had gotten us to the victory, he told me that I deserved the credit for what had happened. He said that by giving my testimony, I'd freed myself and probably also helped other people in unfair conservatorships, which is true. After having my father take credit for everything I did for so long, it meant everything to have this man tell me that I'd made the difference in my own life. And now, finally, it was my own life. So, What is supported decision-making? What does this transition look like for people who have been in conservatorships for quite a while? What can we do to to better support people in this this time? Yeah, so supported decision-making broadly is essentially a description of what everyone does all the time, which is that we don't live our lives in vacuums and we Mm -hmm. talk to people who we trust to help us understand and think about the choices that we make. For example, conversations you might have with your friends about someone you're dating and you're not sure if you want to keep dating them or not. And you, they tell you what, what their thoughts are, what they see about you, whether they think this the person you're dating aligns with you and your values. And you, of course, are still making the decision. Supported decision-making is just a term for that practice that all humans do, um, but that is especially important to recognize with respect to people with disabilities because their capacity is more likely to be called into question. So supported decision-making is a way that people strengthen their own capacity and ability to make choices 
And for people with disabilities, that can be particularly important in order to demonstrate that they have capacity, that they can still make the choice themselves. Brittany's case has been really impactful um, in the public consciousness of understanding what conservatorships are. And um, I think many of us um, didn't even know what conservatorship was before Brittany. I know that you recently worked on a case and successfully got Marie Bergram out of a conservatorship, um, again, from the state of California. And this is also on the heels of Brittany ending her conservatorship. What can you tell us about working on Marie's case and, um, and, and your experience for the future of folks who might be trying to terminate their own conservatorships based on this new landscape that we're operating in? Yeah, so Marie Burgum is um, a young woman uh, with intellectual disabilities, and she has been. She was in a guardianship in Michigan, and then it got moved to California. And she was adamant that she wanted to get out. Her father and stepmother were her conservators, and um, she was very clear that she wanted to try things and she wanted to learn new things, and they didn't let her. And she felt so held back by by that and so adamant over years that she wanted to get out for a long time with with um almost no one supporting her she had a few family members who were very much on her side but it was a very lonely process and marie was a big advocate for the bill that got passed in california she testified um in the state legislature about the importance of um, supported decision-making and ways to get out of conservatorship. And then we used the new bill to get her out of her own conservatorship, which was just wonderful. One of the parts of the bill is that you can have what's called an uncontested termination. So once the actual people involved, the conservator and the conservatee, want the ter- conservatorship to end, the judge shouldn't be second-guessing that. Um And so by the end of Marie's conservatorship, there were conservators in place who were people she trusted. And then earlier this year, the judge ended the conservatorship altogether, gave her her rights back. And it was incredible. It was really, really meaningful for her and for all of us. And so we hope that it will get easier for people to do that and that there's just more familiarity with the idea that people might want to get out of conservatorships. And so I think and I hope that seeing this happen more will will start to change views on this and help more people get out, especially because they're using supported decision making. Amazing. I love that Marie was a part of testifying for the legislation and the legislation that would then help her undo her own conservatorship. There's something very um, symbolic and meaningful about, you know, unlocking your own freedom there that I think is really, really cool. Yeah, there were not many dry eyes in in, in that court here. <laughs> ah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, Zoe, this has been really great. And I really just appreciate all the time that you've taken to go through this book with me. <laughs> I highly recommend it to anyone Um, who's interested in learning more about Brittany's case, but also conservatorships more broadly. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Yeah, thank you, Kendall. This was really fun. And I agree, the book was um, really quite moving in a way that I didn't know that it would be necessarily. And it's really thoughtful in how she talks about her conservatorship and the implications of it practically and emotionally. So I'm really glad we got to talk about it. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. Until next week, stay strong. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Julian Silva-Forbes is our intern. Intern.